While retirement is generally seen as a time of relaxation and self-focus, God calls us to love, serve, and help others for a lifetime. He has been preparing us for this retirement season literally our entire lives. In retirement, countless Christians enter a state of spiritual dormancy, not knowing how they are called to have an impact for God's kingdom. The Retirement Reformation seeks to encourage and empower the 50 million Christians approaching or in retirement to embrace the calling God has been preparing in them. When the world says it's time to stop, you can begin to have your greatest impact. Welcome to I Retire For Him, the mouthpiece of the Retirement Reformation, where our goal is to journey from retirement to reformation so you can say, I retire for him. Hey, reaching out to the 50 million Christ followers in America who are approaching or already in retirement, you've tuned into I Retire For Him, the mouthpiece of the Retirement Reformation. I'm your host, Jim Brangenberg, along with the founder of the Retirement Reformation, Bruce Brinesma. Please check us out online on Facebook, or in in the App Store. Just look for Retirement Reformation online at retirementreformation.org. You know, I don't know exactly when it happened in my life, but I do know that it happened. I sometimes forget that there are costs in following Jesus. Not costs where we will regret them, but costs of living a life different than the life the world presents. And it's no different when we're following Jesus in our retirement. There are costs involved. There are also lies being spoken into our lives that we need to overcome. Today, Bruce and I are going to be digging into the costs of following Jesus in retirement and the lies we need to overcome in our retirement so that we can live with intentionality and effectiveness in all of our retirement years. This discussion is based on chapters 7 and 8 in the book, I Retire For Him, found online at iworkforhim.com forward slash bookstore. Bruce Brinesma, welcome back to I Retire For Him. Hey, Jim. Uh... This four-part series that we're doing, this being the second of, of those four, is just really an encouragement to me. Uh, the opportunity to, to review and to participate with you in, in the, the book that uh, you and Martha and, and with your father-in-law, Ted Haynes, uh, have written. And the, the way that you actually get down to the, some real nitty-gritty that makes a difference. And, and so I'm excited about what we're going to be talking about today with that chapter in 7-8 where we're talking about costs and then also talking about something that you call lies. Yeah, lies. Okay. Uh, and thank you very much, Bruce, for those very, very kind words. Bruce, this idea that there are costs in following Jesus in our retirement, it isn't new, is it? Well, it certainly is not. Uh, you know, Jesus, as he called his disciples, uh, uh, it was clear that they were leaving something. But more importantly, they were going some, somewhere. But the cost of transition is always something to be acknowledged and counted and real, yet it is the transition from to that really leads us in in new directions. And so those costs are, what is it that we have to give up in order to be able to, to follow Jesus and to lead that meaningful life that we talk about? Well, let's talk about some of those costs. I mean, those costs are... You know, really, what Jesus said, I need you to give up everything and come follow me. Okay? Well, yeah, you, you, talk about, you talk about giving up what you call a double life. I, I, was, I was fascinated to, to read that. And, and as Christ followers, consistency in our behavior should be a hallmark of our lives. That's the first line from that first paragraph after you, you introduce that, introduce that topic. And to being an integrated person and reflective of Jesus, and, and not having a Sunday life and a Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday life, uh, but to have and, and to be able to have an integrated life, what a what what value that is! But there's there is that cost of the change, the tra- and the transition, and the intentionality. You know, one of the things when I became a believer at 13, I, I just said, you know what, I, I am going to be who I am, no matter where I am. So that you get what you get. So if you're listening to us here on I Retire For Him, our podcast, or you met me in person, you're going to go, hey, that, that Jim, he's the same guy. But I grew up around Christians who, on their way to church, I grew up around people who call themselves Christians, who are on their way to church, they're arguing, they're screaming, they're yelling, they jump out of the car in the parking lot of church, and everybody's smiling and having a great time. And 
they go to church and the, everything is perfect and they get back in the car and they scream all the way home and the rest of the week is just like, we don't have time for a double life. We have people around us who are going to spend an eternity separated from God in a place called hell. If our lives are double and they don't see any value in, why would I want to become a Jesus follower if that's what I get? It says so much. And, and, it, and it just, we don't have time to have a double life. Bruce, we got to go on to another one. We got to give up our wrong thoughts. You know, 2 Corinthians 5.10 talks about the fact that we got to hold our thoughts captive. And boy, if there's one thing I have struggled with, on the outside, I think I look pretty good most days. Most days. But man, my thoughts, I'm constantly wrestling with my thoughts. And I have to constantly stop and go, that's not a Jesus thought, whether it's a judgmental thing on somebody, but we have to be able to reject those and say, we're moving somewhere different. Do you ever struggle with wrong thoughts, Bruce? Well, how can you not? Uh, Our culture, you know, just simply bombards us with wrong thoughts in so many different areas. And the, the, the culture that, that just, that, that identifies a Christ follower as being wrong, irrelevant, perhaps um, um, uh, not enjoyable, nasty. I had a I had a, a friend many years ago who used to say that he never would go to the grocery store right after uh, church services were out because all he'd see were a bunch of grumpy Christians. Oh man! And 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 so to be able to have our thoughts as as Christ suggested through the power of the Holy Spirit. Focused on what is good, mm. focused on what is true, focused on what is delightful. Right. Changes our lives. And sometimes you just got to flat turn the TV off. You haven't even have a shot at, at clearing all the cobwebs out of your brain. Way better to pick up a great thought. Way better to pick up a great book and read it than the television. Very rarely does TV edify us. You know, in, in this chapter on the costs of following Jesus in retirement. We talk about giving up hoarding wealth because generosity is the thing that brings the most freedom. We're not going to go into that in detail today. We've talked about that on past shows, but giving up worry. We'll talk about that really quickly. In this COVID world that we live in, I see so many Christ followers worried about dying. I'm like, what do you mean you're worried about dying? You know where you're going. This is a celebration thing. And besides, the Lord knows your last day. You don't. You're probably going to die in a car wreck, not from COVID, or you're going to die when you're 90 years old because you're just 90 years old or whatever it may be. But people are so fed, uh, so surrounded by worry. We got we to cast that off. That's not a... Jesus said, what are you worried about? Your heavenly father knows what you need. He knows. He, he, he goes, he keeps track of the birds of the air and the grass of the field. What are you worried about? We also need to give up hurry. As Christ followers, we seem so much in a hurry. We're so busy and hurryful. But those are things that we gotta we gotta talk about in detail in the future, Bruce. But I want to talk about these last two. We gotta give up unforgiveness and we gotta give up damaged relationships. I've seen way too many Jesus followers who just say, I could never forgive them for that. And I'm like, where'd you find that scripture? First hesitations? Because it's not there. As one of the hallmarks of our faith is uh, is forgiveness by our heavenly Father for everything we've done, and Bruce, when we don't give up unforgiveness, what do we end up looking like when we're seventy, eighty, and ninety years old? Well, I think this whole area of uh, another way of saying that is giving up damaged relationships, and we talk about that. One of the benefits of living longer is you have an opportunity not only to grow in your relationship with Christ. But you have to you grow in your emotional maturity, the ability to be able to look at these damaged relationships and to be able to say, I need to do what my part is. And my part may only be forgiveness. There is not going to be any change in their behavior. But I can, through the power of the Holy Spirit, able to step into that damaged relationship, do my part for making sure that my heart and mind, therefore I am not captured to it. I don't worry about it because now it is between the other person and God. Now, often it will result in a reconciliation. There's a, there's a, you know, let's get a cake and have a party, but it may not. Right. But in fact, to be able to release yourself 
from that, from being uh, uh, embraced, from being controlled uh, by that damaged relationship and to be able to let it go and let it be with God, knowing that you have forgiven and get rid of that worry, man, that is huge. And when you look at, and this is just from my own experience, when you look at people who have embraced unforgiveness, they're bitter, they're angry. And when they get older, they get to be grumpy old men. I mean, that movie was like a documentary. Well, it really was because ice fishing is a real thing. But, you know, uh, uh, Matthau, uh, Howard, Matt, uh, what's Walter Matthau, excuse me. This is a perfect example of somebody who's just bitter and angry and it, who, nobody wants to hang around those people. As Jesus followers, everything about us is changing and everyone around us should be benefiting from our faith, whether they believe in Jesus or not, especially by us demonstrating unforgiveness. Bruce, can you, or demonstrating forgiveness, not living in unforgiveness. Bruce, can you imagine what our world would be like if Christ followers who are retired would give up wrong thoughts, a double life, unforgiveness, damaged relationships, hoarding wealth, worry and hurry? What would life be like? Well, one of the results they would not be lonesome. Mm. They would not be lonesome because they would be winsome and their heart and their mind and their actions would look outward and new relationships would come in. Old relationships could be healed. And that loneliness, which is such a plague on older persons and only focusing inward would give them the opportunity to extend outward and lead to that 80, 90, 100, and whatever, to do it in a totally different way with joy and with freedom and with meaning. Mm. You know, I'm going to close out this segment with a, 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 a quote from Brennan Manning. And we used to open up every I Work For Him show with this quote. The greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. We'll be right back with more on I Retire For Him. The Retirement Reformation wants to come alongside you as you navigate in each stage of your retirement. Our online resources include our blog, our downloadable books, and life planning studies, as well as membership and coaching options. Go to retirementreformation.org and use these resources to begin the transformation of your retirement. Journey from retirement to reformation. So you can say, I retire for him. That's retirementreformation.org. Now, back to the show. Hey, welcome back to I Retire For Him. I'm your host, Jim Brangenberg. And as we do in every second segment of I Retire For Him, we bring on a guest who's got a story to tell about them living out their faith in their retirement. But today, a little different permutation. We've got Ron Henry here with Marketplace Chaplains. Ron, you're retirement age, right? Uh, yes, I am. Okay. But you're not done working yet, are you? No, I'm not. In fact, I'm you not. started a new career when you were supposed to be retiring, and you started a new career working for Marketplace Chaplains. Why didn't you just go off and play golf? Uh, there's no purpose in that. I mean, I just really felt I had purpose in my life and, and I had so much, I just felt there was much more to life than what I've already experienced. So that's my quest. And, and I, God has, God has rewarded that passion and desire. So. Wow. I love it. All right. Well, you've also got somebody who's also got that passion and desire to become a marketplace chaplain. Why don't you introduce our guest for today? Who's got a story to share? Yeah. My pleasure to introduce Kyle, Kyle Edmondson. Uh, he's part of our recruitment team at Marketplace Chaplains. And, and as they say, the need for bringing more part-time chaplains aboard is so great. We have close to 400 openings right now. And Kyle is one of the spearhead uh, young men who really, his role is to go out and meet potential chaplain candidates, people who want to have purpose in their life. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Kyle. Well, Kyle, thank you so much for being on I Retire For Him today. Well, Jim, thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate it, sir. Uh, er, but you're not retired yet. So let's, you know, nope. but you've joined Marketplace Chaplains to help attract retirees or soon to be retirees to an amazing opportunity. Let me just ask why, you know, 
Why? Why Marketplace Chaplains? Where did this come from? Well, Marketplace Chaplains has a mission to share the love of God with people in the workplace. And uh, like Ron mentioned, uh, all of our chaplains serve in a very limited part-time role. So for whenever I have the opportunity to speak to seniors or people that are considering retirement, we call them, it's cr- not, we call them chronologically superior folks. That works for me. You should, uh, use you know, the, you should use that word. It's way less offensive than old people. People call me an well, old people. No, I don't like that. Now, Jim, I, did, I didn't say old, Jim. <laughs> 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 Chronologically superior folks, the, the, the people that are, are, are a stage ahead of me that have so much to offer, and, and they're able to, to look at this opportunity to come in and, and be a positive influence in the workplace as a chaplain. So talk to me about who, who makes a great chaplain. That's great. Thank you for asking that. So. For me, whenever I'm speaking to people, an ideal chaplain is somebody that loves Jesus, number one. And number two, has a desire to serve in a relational type ministry. Now, Jim, we have people that serve with us that have been ministers. We have people that have served with us that are are retirees or uh, have worked in the school system. We have people from all over that have a desire to serve. And so one of the initial things is, well, Kyle, I'm interested, but I don't have training. That's okay. We have a training program that everybody goes through. So they're all on the same page, ready to serve in the workplace. Do you have to be super technical to be a chaplain? Well, we do like people to be able to use a smartphone, Jim. And the reason for that, uh, you know, everybody knows how to use a smartphone. And my parents are all in their late 80s. And at Christmas time, it's everybody. Everybody's like this in front of their phone. So that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. It's a very low barrier for entry. But the reason for that, sir, is we use a Marketplace Chaplains app. Now, everybody uses an app, even McDonald's. But we have an app also. And whenever our employees want to speak to one of their chaplains, they're able to go in that app. And we need it to be a smartphone because they can do video chatting. So if they're going through a, an emergency or if they just need to speak to their chaplain for a few minutes, they can go into that app and make a video call and speak to that person. Mm. So talk to me about what, what's, the, what's the job description look like, Kyle, for somebody that's considering chaplaincy or maybe somebody who very much today, the very first time they're signing on to I Retire for in the podcast, and they're going, chaplaincy? I never thought about chaplaincy. I, I'm, a, I, I'm a chronologically superior woman. Would they even want me as a chaplain? I'm a chronologically superior man. Do they, what purpose do I have? What's the job description? Well, Jim, for anybody that stumbled upon I Retire for Him today, I'm very thankful. The job description for a chaplain is, like I mentioned, somebody that loves Jesus and desires to serve in a relational ministry. But when you get down to the nuts and bolts... You say that very quickly. Let's just slow down. Desires to participate in a relational ministry. This is all about relationships. Absolutely. So this isn't about teaching curriculum. No, sir. It's not about, uh, you know, speaking in front of large crowds. It's about relationships. And where that relationship, where the rubber meets the road, our chaplains have a very unique opportunity to go somewhere that they couldn't walk in by themselves. Like me, myself, I could not walk down the street, have security at the uh, wire manufacturing place and start talking to employees. But because of the work of people like Ron Henry that build relationships with CEOs, our chaplains are able to go places and speak to people where they are. And we believe that the workplace is the largest local mission field. So like you asked specifically, when our chaplains go in, they serve in a very limited part-time role. They go and they meet with the different people at the company. Now, one of the things I often hear is, am I the only chaplain? You know, for somebody that's never served as a chaplain before, that could feel like a lot of weight. This entire company's chaplain needs are on my shoulders. And the answer to that is no. We have chaplain teams. Our chaplain teams are made of men and women to represent the diversity of the company that we serve. Whenever I'm talking to people, Jim, I like to call it a chaplain safety net. So what I mean by that, if you'll, if you'll go along with me, let's sure. say you were interested in being a chaplain, Jim, and you have flexibility in your schedule on Tuesday afternoon. So that's when you go. Well, you're going and you're speaking to the gentleman there, but you're doing it in bite-sized conversations because those folks are on the clock. Now, like I mentioned, the companies want us there, but they don't want the chaplains to sit down for half an hour to speak to every employee. So you're having these bite-sized conversations of two to three to four minutes and, and building relationships and coming to a place where these people look at you as somebody they can, they can talk to about issues that they're experiencing in their life, uh, stressors in their family, stressors at work. Now, I go on Friday mornings and I'm seeing the same people, Jim. So what that means is if one of these people has a need, 
and they they pull out that smartphone like we were just talking about and they're like well i i could call jim i could call kyle i could call chaplain linda there's all these people that they know care about them so that's one of the really exciting things about what our chaplains do when you get down to the rubber meets the road but they're making visits building relationships and ultimately it's our prayer that the chaplains have the opportunity to share the love of Jesus with those who don't know him in the workplace. So talk about job benefits. When you see somebody talking about, here's what I love most about working for marketplace chaplains and being a marketplace chaplain, what do they say? What I hear is that it it gives them an opportunity to still be used. And I I think it kind of ties into what you're talking about uh, with the chronologically advanced folks. The seniors, the retirees. Chronologically superior. You just threw that, you threw that term right down the bus. Chronologically advanced. Might as well just call us old people then. That's what you really feel like. <laughs> Let me just stick with soon to be retirees then, Jim. But whenever I get the opportunity to speak to people that are about to retire and, and, and I ask them, you know, why are you interested in this? And the reoccurring theme I hear is that the Lord is not done with me. I can still serve. And what's great, just a few minutes ago, when, when Ron introduced me, you asked him, why wasn't he on the golf course? Ron said, because he wasn't done yet. And I get to hear that day after day. And as a recruiter and as a, a Christian that's, that's still moving along towards retirement, what a blessing. It's so wonderful to be able to hear the people that are a few steps ahead of me saying, God's not done with me. Where can I be used? You too can join the team, the Kyle and Ron, and many, many thousands have joined mchapusa.com, mchapusa.com. Kyle Edmondson, thank you for sharing your story today. Thank you, Jim. I sure appreciate it, sir. You listen to the I Retire For Him. We'll be right back. Every I Retire For Him show goes so quickly, we don't often get to remind you that there are two resources you should be checking out right now. I recommend that you get a copy of the Retirement Reformation book and the I Retire For Him book. Retirement Reformation focuses on the mindset and behavioral changes needed, let's just say paradigm shifting, that is needed to live out your faith in retirement. I Retire For Him is focused on many of the ways you can put your faith into action by investing your life into others in your retirement years. Get both at the Retirement Reformation website in the bookstore, retirementreformation.org. That's retirementreformation.org. Hey, welcome back to I Retire For Him. Fantastic conversation with Kyle Edmondson great conversation just hearing about his story and how being a chaplain has impacted his life. Bruce, one of the things that I've observed, and I'm sure you've observed it too, is that as Jesus followers, we've been taught a lot of lies. That's what I'm going to call them. I know you didn't agree with that, but we'll, we'll get argue about that in a minute. A lot of lies about our faith, or maybe we've learned a lot of wrong thinking about our faith. I'd really like to focus on the part of this last part of the show on the lies that we need to overcome in order for us to live out our faith in every part of our lives with intentionality, especially in our retirement. Is that okay? That's absolutely. I'm looking forward to how we're going to be able to dialogue about that and be able to share the, the God's wisdom about that with our audience. All right. So my line number one is that my faith impacts only part of my life. Bruce, I've done enough golfing and know that people who follow Jesus are typically very different on the golf course than they are in Sunday school. How do we make sure that our faith impacts all of our life? Closer our walk with the word being in the Bible, the more that our prayers are specific and our time is spent listening not just talking, that as we grow in our spiritual journey and we see the absolute benefit of what it means to be a Christ follower, the less engaging and the less motivating it is to be that different person on the golf course, as you talked about. I don't mean to pick on golfers because people are different at Costco too. I mean, you just got to throw people at Costco <laughs> and people are different at Walmart for sure. But it's that that idea that we can't have a double life and that the lie is that, you know, I was taught this lie and I literally was taught this lie, Bruce, as a 22 year old entrepreneur, business is business and church is church. They have nothing to do with each other. So make a lot of money in business and give the money to the church and maybe you'll serve on a committee one day. That 
was a lie. Because if somebody had just told me as a 22-year-old entrepreneur, hey, Jim, your calling is to the marketplace. Your ministry place and mission place is to the marketplace where God has given you this ability to run a business where you have employees and customers and vendors, and that's your place of ministry. Those words would have transformed the first 20 years of my time in the marketplace. The, I think, first of all, when we talk about lies, to understand that they are the barriers to our witness and to our personal growth. The lies are the barriers. And the degree to which those lies are identified, what will happen with the truth? The truth will do what? Set you free. Mm-hmm. And so the degree to which that we're able to identify these barriers that are keeping us from being all that God wants us to be, and then be able to um, uh, understand what is true. As a matter of fact, with my my team here uh, in the Retirement Reformation, one of the things we've talked about recently a couple of different times is that when we're faced with a problem, where do we start? Well, let's start with finding out what is true. Mm. And when you start out finding what is true, by definition, you're also identifying the lies that are standing between you and the truth. Well, and, and honestly, what I find is that a lot of Jesus followers haven't read their Bible. The 1,500 plus page manual that God gives us on hit from his heart to our lives on this is what life, living life should look like. And when you start to study that, you realize, yeah, people were pretty much real. Like David, when he was real as a shepherd, And then as a warrior, and then as a king, he was just who he was. And his faith bled through everywhere. Even when he screwed up, his faith bled through all of his life. You know, Bruce, I want to move on to line number two, because not only does our faith need to impact all of our life, we need to recognize that we're not a second-tier citizen. If if we're not a pastor or a missionary, we're not a second-tier citizen in the kingdom. You as a business guy, me as a business guy, we're not second-class that God has called all of us. We're all part of the body of Christ. Some people get to be mouthpieces, but some people got to be corpuscles. Some people got to be feet and arms and hands. Some people got to be the, uh, the epididymis. You know, they got to be the hairs on the epididymis. You know, whatever your role may be, ligament or tendon or muscle, uh, or maybe you're the heart or you're the lung. But we need to recognize that there's no tier system in the kingdom. There's no tier system in the kingdom. There's nowhere that Jesus says, well, if you really want to be important in the kingdom, you'll quit every job that you have and go work in a church. In retirement, we need to understand that, don't we, Bruce? It is, it is a critical understanding, Jim, from the, you know, from the early stages of our lives. But as we, as we age and as we get to those retirement years, it is even more critical because the lie that we are being told is that, in fact, Oh, you're going downhill. You're useless. There's nothing you can do. You better you better grab something good for you because man, it ain't going to be good going forward. And that lie is the is is not only a a, a barrier, but man, it is a huge wall and it controls all your thinking and all your actions. So the only way is to break through that wall to freedom and to go from lies to God's truth. And God's truth is that we're all called and that we all have a role in the kingdom. And uh, that's what I love about the fact that Ted Haynes wrote his story inside I Retire for Him, because he talks about how God used him and he never saw himself as a second-class citizen. In fact, Ted's health is is failing. The last couple months ago, now it's last month, he was in the hospital. And what was hilarious is he was in the hospital like four or five hours and he calls Martha and he goes, I need you to get down here right away. What's wrong, Dad? No, no, I'm out of I'm out of gospels. I, I'm out of pocket testaments. I need more. Can you? I need I need Haitian ones. I need uh, I need Spanish ones. I need English ones. I need you to get down here right away. So he's laying in the hospital with tubes and pipes and all kinds of things. And he's and he's running out of gospels because he understands that he's getting exposure to people that pastors will never get exposure to. And the same thing goes on in our neighborhoods. We live around people who 70% of them are likely never to darken the doorstep of a church. Yet Jesus is right there next to them because we live in the neighborhood. And that's our call. We've got an opportunity to touch the lives of people because we're surrounded by lost and hopeless people. 
and that's what's so important. Bruce? If I, if I can. Uh, you can. Call our audience. Uh, get a copy of the book and go to page 85. On page 85, Jim says this. Retirement is full of opportunities to build relationships for the kingdom. Full of opportunities to build relationships for the kingdom. And the story that you were just sharing about Ted is just a, a, a really poignant example of that. doesn't matter where we are, how many tubes, how many no tubes, whether we're on the tube, whatever it is, that we have that opportunity to build relationships for Jesus. And in fact, the lie is, oh no, you can't. And the lie is you never retire from your Christianity. Your call doesn't retire when you do. And that God is not done with you, yet you are super valuable. And God has you right where you are on purpose, whether you've gone back to work or you're volunteering somewhere, or maybe you are playing golf or tennis or pickleball, or you're hiking in Colorado. Wherever you are, you are a light. And you've got an opportunity to share what God has done in your life with others and to be an attractive light. And those lies, let's just put those behind us and realize God's not done with you yet. You know when you'll know he's done with you? When you meet him face to face. Great conversation, Bruce. Thanks for being with us today on I Retire For Him. You've been listening to I Retire For Him, the mouthpiece of the Retirement Reformation with your host, Jim Brangenberg, and of course, the founder of the Retirement Reformation, Bruce Brinesma. Check us out online, retirementreformation.org. If you want to get a copy of the I Retire For Him book, go to iworkforhim.com forward slash bookstore. We're Christ followers journeying from retirement to reformation so that ultimately we can say together, I retire for him. I retire for him. Thanks for listening to I Retire For Him with your hosts, Jim and Martha Brangenberg and Retirement Reformation founder, Bruce Brinesma. I Retire For Him is the mouthpiece of the Retirement Reformation. Most Christians tend to follow the world's pattern of rest and self-pampering during retirement. However, in your retirement, you can be focused on God's unique call to love, serve, and help others. This can be your best season of life if you take advantage of a life's worth of knowledge and experience and combine it with a greater freedom of time and money and invest it all in the generations both preceding and following you. The Retirement Reformation is encouraging Christians to find and follow God's call in all seasons and aspects of life, especially in retirement. Take time to sign the manifesto at retirementreformation.org and explore the wealth of resources available on our site. Join this movement of God and journey from retirement to reformation so you can say, I retire for him. Go to retirementreformation.org.